Hi everyone, in this session we want to talk about why Jesus Christ came. And so in this topic we'll include the following things. First, how God originally designed man to operate most efficiently. And remember the Maker's Manual from session one. Two, what happened when man fell? Three, why Jesus Christ had to come to earth as a human. And four, how God through Jesus Christ has restored man's mandate to exercise his dominion, his, his authority or dominion with which he was created. So setting the scene, we need to understand why Jesus had to come to earth as a human and to die as a sacrifice for us. So let's set, set the scene. Set, so let's set the scene. First, by looking at the decision God made to send his son as a human being. And so from this, so this is what Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 and 23 says. And this is God's announcement by the archangel Gabriel to Joseph, who was engaged to Mary. And that's that's Jesus' the mother. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. This was the first and only time in human history that God stepped into the cycle of human reproduction so that his son could become a human being. The chain of original sin, which was transmitted through human reproduction, was broken as Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. God knew that only a perfect human would be able to bring mankind back to him. And that is why Jesus was called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us, God in human form. When you think of what it cost the Son of God to leave his eternal glory in heaven and be born as a human and be subject to human limitations, it's absolutely staggering. And we could well say that Jesus is our hero. And the Collins English Dictionary defines hero as a being of extraordinary strength and courage, often the offspring of a mortal and a god who was celebrated for his exploits. Exploits. That is what Jesus is. He is our hero. Now let's go back to the beginning and to see how God originally created man and how he designed man to operate most efficiently. So let's start right at the beginning. And that's before the fall. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, it says this. Then God said, let us make people in our image to be just like ourselves. They'll be masters over all earth, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the livestock, wild animals and small animals. So God created man in his own image. God patterned them after himself, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and told them, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Be masters over the fish and the birds and all the animals. God created mankind to be masters over all life on, the, on earth, to have dominion, to be rulers of the earth. God delegated to man the right to rule the earth. He designed man to be accountable to God and also to have free will so that he could exercise this dominion. God planned that man, not Satan, was to be the prince of this world. So let's look at the issue of man's free will. God is a God of love, and the only way he could relate to his, to his created human beings was on the basis of love. Seeing that true love can only exist where there's free will, God had to take the risk in making man with free will. So man could exercise free will in every part of his life. And that included his relationship with God, his relationship with one another and with God's creation in the plant and animal kingdom. 
In exercising free will, Mr. and Mrs. Adam could tend the Garden of Eden and subdue the earth. To see how they did that, let's look at man's delegated dominion. God's intention in delegating dominion to man was that he was to subdue the earth. That is to make the rest of the earth like the Garden of Eden, which God had planted. To subdue meant that he was to exercise his dominion, bringing godly order by ruling over the earth. He was also to put under his feet the forces of evil that he would soon encounter and crush them. This is what God did in delegating his dominion to man. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, it says this, The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and care for it. But the Lord God gave him this warning, You may freely eat, any fruit in the garden except fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. God gave man something to do and also something that he must not do. That's free will. They would attend and care for the Garden of Eden, but they were not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In both of these areas, they had to exercise free will. But here we can see the risk God took in making man in his image with free will. There was the potential that they could exercise their, their will independently of God's will. That also meant that he couldn't stop Mr. and Mrs. Adam if they chose to go against his will and that he could not prevent him from suffering the consequences of exercising their free will independently of his will. The Bible now goes on to tell us about man's fall through being deceived. And Satan knew that the only way he could deceive Adam and Eve was to get them to doubt what God had said to them. And that is exactly what he did. And by the way, Satan still uses deception as one of his major weapons to draw people away from God and cause them to doubt God's word. Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 7, shows how Satan deceived them. And this is what it says. Now the serpent was as shrewd as all the creatures the Lord had made. Really, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? Of course we may eat it, the woman told him. It's only the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God says that we must not eat it or even touch it or we will die. You won't die, the serpent hissed. God knows that your eyes will be open when you eat it. You'll become just like God, knowing everything, both good and evil. The woman was convinced. The fruit looked so fresh and delicious and it would make her so wise. So she ate some of the fruit. She also gave to a some to her husband who was with her. Then he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they strung fig leaves together around their hips to cover themselves. The exercise of free will always involves consequences. And there were consequences to listening to the serpent instead of God. And as soon as they ate of the fruit, ate the fruit of the forbidden tree, Adam and Eve fell. They handed over their delegated right to rule the earth. And not only did they forfeit their close relationship with God, they lost the power that God had given them to rule the earth. Now their dominion was forfeited to the serpent Satan, and the earth became Satan's kingdom. Satan, through the deception of Adam and Eve, became the prince of this world. And as Jesus named him in John chapter 12, verse 31, John 14, 30, and 16, 11, the earth, which was, whence, which was once man's kingdom, comes under a curse, and Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve are driven out of the Garden of Eden 
and prevent us from entering in again, again. God, who is righteous and just, could not just overlook what they had done. He had to address their disobedience, and that is why he drove them out of the Garden of Eden and out of the privileges they enjoyed there. But in Genesis 3, chapter 15, God also promises hope for Adam and Eve as he announces to the servant how he will restore the dominion they had lost. The offspring of the, of the woman, that is, Jesus Christ, would crush the head of the serpent and restore dominion to man. In making coats of skin for Adam and Eve, God had to sacrifice innocent animals for their guilt, and that was the first earthly picture of what he would actually do in his son Jesus on the cross. They received these coats of skin by faith, even as we received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Aren't you glad that you're no longer in the kingdom of stuck in that kingdom where Satan dominated your free will? God has rescued you from that kingdom and transferred you into his kingdom of light so that you can use your free will constructively as God intended. John 10:10 10, 10 could sorry, John chapter 10, verse 10 could almost be called the mission statement for the rulers of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Jesus Christ summed up the mission in one sentence by stating this. And this is what he said. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. The mission of the thief, Satan, and the mission of Jesus are completely opposite. Satan brings bondage and death. He wants to rob us all of God's blessings. Jesus brings us life in all its fullness. He did this by being prepared to go through death on the cross and then conquer death by his resurrection. So he announces here his intention to recover and restore everything that God had planned for man. He was going to destroy Satan's mission to rob, kill, and destroy, and to prevent man from receiving life, liberty, and freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and this is the central reason that Jesus Christ came to earth as a human. And this is confirmed in 1 John chapter 3, 8b, where John wrote this. But the Son of God came to destroy these works of the devil. And that is what and that is what Jesus did as he lived his human life on earth and as he died on the cross, he destroyed the works of the devil, who had the power of death and kept people in bondage to the fear of death. How do we know this? Because he defeated death. In rising from the dead from the dead, death could not keep him down. Jesus came to give life. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, it says this: Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. As we saw in John chapter, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus could give life because he is life. Jesus came to earth and willingly chose to die on the cross so that he could give us eternal life. He deliberately chose to lay down his life so that he could give us life. life. And Jesus is far more powerful than anything or anyone else because when we're in his hand, nothing at all, not even the devil, can snatch us out of his hand. And this is what he said in John chapter 10, verses 28 to 30. And this is what Jesus said to you and me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me and he's more powerful than anyone else. So no one can take them from me. The father and I are one. Now, Jesus understands all our feelings. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, tells us that Jesus shared 
human life with us so that he could go through the so that he could go through death and destroy the devil by doing so but one other great fact is that he understands us verse 17 says that he is a merciful and faithful high priest he understands our humanity because he's been through the mill of human life Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this. The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. Isn't it great to know that Jesus completely understands and knows our feelings? When we are tempted, he can sympathize with us and understand what we go through as humans because he was human too. The kingdom of darkness brings torment, and that is reflected in how evil spirits torment people here on the earth. The Bible tells us that hell, which is the end result of living in the kingdom of darkness, is the ultimate place of torment. But Jesus came to bring peace and rest, and what a difference there is in the kingdom of light. The Bible calls Jesus the Prince of Peace, in Isaiah 9, in Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verse 6. And peace is what Jesus promised to all who come to him. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, we read this. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke fits perfectly and the burden i give you is light the term yoke that jesus used in these verses is a name for the piece of timber that joins two animals together so that they can pull a plow a cart or whatever the oxen are hits to jesus is saying that we can be teamed up with him in all that we do in life he promises that we can come to him, learn from him, and find rest for our souls in him. His yoke is light and easy, unlike the yoke that we carried in the kingdom of darkness, which became an increasingly heavy burden. When Jesus used the term easy, he was referring to when a yoke was fitted to the two animals exactly so that it would not chafe them as they pulled the plow. And that was part of the after sale service of the carpenter who made the yokes. Jesus would make the yoke in his carpenter's shop in Nazareth, where he lived. And once the farmer bought the yoke, the carpenter would go to the farm and custom fit the yoke to suit each ox that would be put in that yoke. And no other ox would be used with that particular yoke. God knows each one of us intimately. And he knows how to fit his yoke exactly for each one of us so that we can find peace and rest as we walk through life together with him. There's no need to struggle, but simply be harnessed in the same yoke and go where Jesus is going. All we have to do is walk alongside him. And in that, there is a true rest. Jesus took out our diseases on himself. And God loves us so much that he, that he planned that Jesus, his son, should come to take on himself all our diseases. God had promised to his people in the Old Testament days, I am the Lord who heals you. Now we find that he provides healing for us in the person of his son, Jesus. And that's one of the reasons that he died for us on the cross so that we could be healed. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says this, He personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross so that so we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. You've been healed by his wounds. And healing is not automatic. Jesus Christ's death on the cross makes healing available. But we have to receive it by faith, just as we have received Jesus as our Saviour and Lord by faith, and we became his children, we receive his healing for our bodies and our souls in the same way 
by faith in him. Jesus came by choice. And let's see what he said of himself as the good shepherd and how he would give his life for his sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 11, 15, 17 and 18, he said these things. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. Verse 15, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may have it back again. And verse 18, no one can take my life from me. I lay down my life voluntarily, for I have the right to lay it down when I want to and also the power to take it again. Jesus was in control of his life and he willingly laid down his life for us because he knew that was the only way we could receive life in all its fullness for ourselves. As Jesus was being tried before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, just before his crucifixion, he clearly indicates in his reply to Pilate that he, that he came to earth by his choice. It was no accident of history. Jesus knew that he came on a mission. And in John chapter 18, verse 37, it says this. Pilate replied, you are a king then. You say that I'm a king and you are right, Jesus said. I was born for that purpose and I came to bring truth to the world. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Paul tells us the same thing in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, when he wrote of Jesus. And this is what he said. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. It's good to know that Jesus came to earth of his own free will. He did not need to be forced. It was his choice because he loves us so much. Let's apply this to ourselves. The logical consequences of coming into relationship with God through receiving Jesus as our Savior is the God-given ability, God ability to exercise free will in the right way as God designed Adam in the first place <clears throat> jesus took our sin on himself and the ultimate reason for jesus to come to earth was to take our sin upon himself and in john chapter 1 verse 29 it says this the next day john saw jesus coming towards him and said look there is the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world John used the, uses the language of the Old Testament to, so, to show that Jesus was the person who would take away the world's sin on himself. In Old Testament Israel, the lamb was used as a sacrifice to cover a person's sin as his blood was shed on their behalf. The innocent lamb died in the guilty person's place and John was directing his attention John was directing the attention of the people to the fact that Jesus would shed his own blood willingly and take our sins on himself so that our sins could be finally put away and not just covered. Man's delegated dominion restored. We've seen that when man fell in the Garden of Eden, he forfeited to Satan his delegated dominion or authority over the earth. And from that time on, Satan became the prince of this world. Jesus came to this earth as a human to restore back to man the dominion he had forfeited to Satan. Let's look at Jesus' grounds of authority. How did Jesus get this authority? By taking our sin upon himself on the cross and cancelling the legal de debt that was against our name. And in the process, he stripped the demonic host of their power so that they could not have authority over God's children anymore. And listen as I read Colossians chapter, through, chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not uh, yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it 
and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. And in this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. The gospel tells us about the authority of Jesus Christ in action. Jesus' lifestyle as a human being on earth and his service to others showed us what it should be like to exercise God's delegated dominion. And the following has been a tiny sample of how Jesus demonstrated his authority as the Son of Man. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, it says this, That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. All the spirits fled when he commanded them to leave and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through Isaiah, who said he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. Isaiah prophesied 740 years earlier that Jesus had authority over both physical and spiritual afflictions. And in the space of one chapter in Luke 8, Jesus exercised his authority in various situations. A demon-possessed man was delivered. A woman was healed of an issue of blood and a girl was raised to life, all in the space of one day's journey. Listen to Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 19, and it recalls something of Jesus' healing ministry. And it says this, When I came down the slopes of the mountain, the disciples stood with Jesus on a large level area, surrounded by many of his followers and by the crowds. There were people from all over Judea and from Jerusalem and from as far north as the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. They'd come to hear him and to be healed. And Jesus cast out many evil spirits and everyone was trying to touch him because healing power went out from him and they were all cured. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19 illustrates Jesus' authority, not only over spiritual and physical afflictions, but even over the forces of nature as he stilled the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And for example, in chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, we read of his incredible love as he reached out and touched the a leper and healed him. And that was an unthinkable thing to do in Judea of Jesus' time. Now, Jesus Christ delegates his authority. Another reason for Jesus coming to earth was that he could delegate his authority or pass on his authority to his disciples. In Mark chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, we read how Jesus called his disciples to him, and then after choosing 12 men, he delegated his authority to them. And this is what it says. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called the ones he wanted to go with him, and they came to him. Then he selected 12 of them to be his regular companions, calling them apostles. He sent them out to preach, and he gave them authority to cast out demons, so they were able to go and announce the good news and to cast out demons. In the book of Acts, Jesus sent the apostles to continue the work that he began. The Lord Jesus Christ delegated great power and authority to them. He gave them the power of the Holy Spirit so they could do what they had been sent to do. In Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 5, verses, uh, actually, let me just see this. It could be, it could be a mistake here. So either Acts, Acts chapter 5 or chapter 12, verses 14 to 16. Looks like it's, looks like it's Acts, Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Yes, that's what it is. It's just a typo here, sorry. So Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Gives us an account of Jesus' delegated authority in action. And this is what it says. Meanwhile, the apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. 
and more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came in from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. As Jesus' disciples, they were able to exercise the same kind of dominion that Jesus exercised, which was what God had given to Adam, as we saw in Genesis 1. Jesus delegated his authority to his disciples almost as the last thing before he left this earth and ascended to his Father in heaven. In Matthew 28, verse 18, it says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given complete authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has complete authority in heaven and on earth, and his purpose is to restore to his disciples the dominion that Adam lost when he fell. And as his disciples, he delegates the same authority to us today. As we walk in relationship with him, he not only gives us authority to rule the earth as God planned for man in the first place, but also to put the evil hosts of the kingdom of darkness under his feet. He promised us that he will be with us even until the world ends. And that's absolutely great news. Now, Jesus Christ was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So his ministry began when him, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit came together. And let me just read this out because we'll introduce you to the Holy Spirit in the next module. As Peter taught, and this is what I'm just reading here with this. As Peter talked to the Roman centurion Cornelius and those who were in his house, he summed up really well what Jesus did in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Luke recalls what he said in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And it says this, And no doubt you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And even as Peter talked to these Roman seekers, the same Holy Spirit who anointed Jesus fell on all who heard and they were transformed immediately. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's the third person of the Godhead. And next session will be an exciting one as we find out more about who he is, the Holy Spirit. So thanks for listening. I Hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope that's helped you understand why Jesus came. Amen? Amen.